much as Pashala for this distinction between responsibility and power and you know what really this kind of power of us means and how perverse it, it is. Thank you very much. Uh, the next speaker is again our very own Christina from School of Architecture and also in this case uh, we have met before we met. Uh, Christina was leading, she invented in fact, the Pushana practice module here in Sheffield. And when I was teaching and I was leading a match program in, in Plymouth, uh, we are extremely inspired by what was done here. So in fact, uh, we are stealing some of her ideas. Okay? So you know, thank you very much that you agreed to talk to us. Thank you. Thank you. Tatiana and I had no communications about this talk, and uh, uh, my, my brain is a bit in overdrive after Tatiana's talk because it's so uh, dense and only comprehensive and systematic. Uh, my talk is a little bit um, complementary to that. Um, there's, a, there's a different focus, but also uh, a lot of overlapping. Um, I'm speaking, and, and the first slide is a, is a work I've done with Tatiana when we worked together in the studio on housing design. Um, I'm speaking as an educator, as an architect, and as a citizen, although technically I'm a new migrant with limited right to vote in this country. Um, in most of my work, I've been uh, advocating for collective ways of producing the city. Um, and I've done it for contributing to the establishment of a, a community owned and managed asset like Portland Works, um, facilitating co housing groups, teaching live design studios, researching collective custom build, uh, setting up the community land trust, especially <coughs> community land trust. And I focus so much of my work on collective endeavours uh, within the city because I see them as spaces of resistance to the, the neoliberal forces that shape the city. Um, within the, no, the neoliberal, the dominant neoliberal worldview, uh, us as individuals become isolated consumers and we are at the mercy of the laws of supply and demand. So any idea of collective action is really uh, undermined. And Richard Sennett points out how in the context of an economic system based on short-term labour, precarity of workforce, fragmentation of institutions, which Satyana also alluded to, like in today's uh, capitalism, workers are usually prevented from engaging in mutually supportive social relationships. Um, however, you know, there is a really interesting and vibrant conceptual uh, landscape of, of initiatives that focus on uh, mutual uh, relationships. <coughs> the focus on uh, community organizational structures, forms of ownership, uh, from customary to commons, co uh, co cooperative, <coughs> mutual, mutual, charitable, there's a plethora of, sort of legal formats as well associated with that. Uh, but also um, economics and governance models are emerging. Um, other views of economics, including feminist approaches to economics, uh, have been made <coughs> from, from this is back from back in the 70s, have uh, prepared the ground for um, a stream of academic work today um, that is concerned with diverse economies. And I'm quoting a uh, work by um, Gibson Graham, um, which talk about um, this type of work as choosing to bring, I'm quoting, uh, uh, bring marginalised, hidden and alternative economic activities to light in order to make them more real and more credible as objects of policy and activism. So there is a very conscious choice to focus on things that are overlooked and considered as minor, to put them in the spotlight and sort of try to uh, rebalance how we understand them. So in this context, for a special practice which for me, only partially overlaps with architecture and Tatiana uh, I don't know how much value it is. For me, special practice involves um, understanding the complex interactions between people, places, the materials, economies, infrastructure, and the governance, especially. Um, so, often 
one neglected aspect of spatial practice is how decisions are made and who makes them. Um, decisions making really shapes the city at all levels. So from city government and planners constructing, uh, making some sort of large scale spatial plans to uh, developers and designers team proposing new development to uh, small groups proposing and intervening in some areas and, and Tatiana did a sort of systematic uh, categorization of a lot of those uh, type of activity. Um, some process uh, of decision making which shapes the built environment are enshrined in statutes and embedded in long standing practices so that it's clear we know how it works and there's set procedures that they need to be followed. But some are one off, uh, contingent, not fully planned, uh, required in processes, and bring together those, might bring together those that could, could, don't usually work together. Um, and some are simply reactive to situations that are perceived as uh, emergency. Sometimes this uh, uh, emergency mode is artificially constructed, as I would argue is, is the case with uh, a lot of the um, uh, rhetoric around austerity and also security. <coughs> I did have a slide about um, I would argue that understanding how decisions are made uh, and who is not, who is included and who is not included included in process and why and how the stories of the decision making process are told is uh, <coughs> of crucial importance for spatial practitioners with an ethical stance and I would maybe underline that uh, not all spatial practitioners have an ethical stance uh, and all for not, not for all spatial practitioners the ethics of their work is of primary importance. Um, as an educator and designer, I try to put forward a number of strategies to develop uh, support systems at a range of scales. So what I'm trying to do is to foster the emergence of collective endeavours in the city. But also, I'm also extremely uh, concerned and mindful about the ethics of my work and constantly reflect on the <coughs> micropolitics of my work. Uh, so in this talk, I'll try to reflect on how processes that shape the production of the city are created, uh, by whom and what for, um, and I'm doing that to problematise and critique our work as practitioners, students and academics. So I'm not going to offer an, uh, a comprehensive uh, overview <coughs> or a definite, uh, definitive um, statement, uh, it's just offering uh, a series of questions and a starting point for hopefully work that you might uh, develop yourselves. Um, so one word of caution about reading through the rhetorics that we are bombarded with, um, community, and Tatiana also mentioned to this, uh, alluded to this, community engagement, participatory work and co-production are key concepts underpinning uh, the work of many of us, and especially within the School of Architecture in Sheffield, uh, where there is a genuine long-standing tradition of research and practice around this concept. However, even within our School of Architecture, these terms are often used uh, without really delving into the details of those relationships. Um, you will hear this afternoon Kelly talking about the Civic University, and how it could be argued that uh, the, Sheffield the University of Sheffield claimed to be a civic university. And I quote, um, civic uh, university engaged with the communities that surround it, lacks of any concrete meeting to the majority of Sheffield citizens. I would argue that um, the engaged uh, civic university is an attempt to reconcile neoliberal pressures and ethical stances within university. And that even our flagship life project, uh, with the aims and methods so aligned with those of the civic university, are part of this attempt. However, I would also argue that because of their affinity with the objectives of the civic engaged university, life projects can also be an ideal place <coughs> in which we can resist and contest academic capitalism from within. So uh, this would also work as 
uh, this could characterize some life projects as particular as a particular form of what Morrow calls um, <coughs> centralization activism. So a type of activism through which, from within the system, we we, we create shifts of in understanding. Uh, Matthew Flinders uh, is a professor of politics uh, at this university, and um, he's done really interesting work on co-production. And he stresses that the hidden politics of co-production are under-acknowledged, meaning that the limits and the risks associated with it are not openly discussed, and, are complex, and the, there are complex power relations, uh, competing incentives, value, expectation, priorities, uh, <coughs> might often come in the way in what is often described as a win-win approach. Surely co-production is great and everybody should be doing it. Um, co-production says Flinders often remains little more than a buzzword. Um, so the ability to read through the rhetoric and develop independent and nuanced critical position, I would argue, is really a key, another key skill for both spatial practitioners and active citizens. And on, oops, I think start the slide, sorry. Um, on this, um, only last week, uh, Ireland President Michael Higgins said that, um, admittedly, he was talking at an event celebrating uh, World Philosophy Day, so it maybe was a little bit of fire. <laughs> But he, he put forward that studying philosophy contributes to even our post-truth society, where uh, anti-intellectualism has been populism and uh, the, the insecure and excluded have fallen into populism. Uh, so he can say that um, philosophy would help to discriminate between truthful language and illusory rhetoric. Ben Fluberg put forward a research method for planning research, which he calls phronetic. Now, uh, why does he use such an obscure and difficult word, and what does this word mean? Um, it, phronetic is an objective that comes from uh, Aristotle's phronesis, which could be translated as ethics in action. And for, um, for Aristotle's, um, the three main uh, intellectual values were uh, phronesis, um, uh, episteme, the scientific knowledge, and technique, craft, art. And um, for Aristotle was very clear that phronesis was the most important. And Fluberg um, in um, so, uh, building on, on, on this idea of uh, ethics in action and uh, judgment, of, uh, value judgment, uh, focus to practice. <coughs> he also uh, adds the notion of power that we need to consider. So for Fleberg, um, a phonetic approach to research, uh, which I, I would add it could translate to a spatial practice, uh, should add the following guidelines. Uh, should be focused on values, uh, put power at the core of the analysis, emphasize little things, look at practice before the scores, study cases and context, um, ask how, and create that narratives around that, uh, move beyond agency and structure, and create dialogues within a polyphony of voices. And so it's really creating the, the mechanisms through which many voices can uh, interact meaningfully. Also, um, in a very pragmatic way, Fluberg uh, sort of condenses his approach to uh, plan frenetic planning research to something that answers the following question. Where are we going? Who gains and who loses? By which mechanism and by which mechanism of power? And is this desirable? Uh, and what, if anything, should we do about it? Um, and I think I found this really um, helpful and pragmatic angle uh, 
for reflecting on our practice. <coughs> John Forrest's work um, with planners over a few decades has focused on understanding the contingent practices that they developed in an attempt to mediate between public participation and public planning products. You notice that I refer to a lot of planning literature, and it is because I feel that as a discipline, planning has been dealing with certain issues for much longer than the discipline of architecture. Um, so, John Forrest uh, acknowledges that the notion of interest in communi and community are politically shaped. So, not only by planners' imagination, by, but by, crucially, by who uh, speaks and who does not, who attends meetings and who does not, um, which interests have particular and effective advocates and who do not. Um, the concept of community also needs problematizing. Um, and I would argue that when we use the term community, we are constructing narratives that privilege one view over others, generally. Uh, we need to be aware of how the term is exploited and used as a proxy for collectivity and collective interest. Who is in and who is out, and who decide and why. So, talking about community is the illusion that a particular project is for the interest of all, and frees us from having to specify how representative is the community that we describe. So would a very articulate group of retired middle class affluent white people count? Was, was that a community? Um, or how big a range of different small and unrepresentative small groups uh, do we need to include to be able to talk about community without abusing the term? <coughs> I have been involved uh, in two campaigns to save buildings with the social technical systems associated to them. One was successful, one was not successful. Uh, in both campaigns, the word community featured quite prominently. The former site of the Castle Market is a contested urban space that for me symbolizes the dominant mode of producing the city. A top-down plan was made, resting on a vision developed decades ago and based on economic models that are no longer valid. This decision was carried through to meet and to minimize friction and unrest, voice, support and space was given to small citizen groups whose mission and values were aligned with those of the city council. In other words, for me, uh, a narrative was constructed of community support for a plan that was not in the interest of the majority. Um, after the demolition was carried through, <coughs> communities um, have also been called to join in, to express views, but the scope of their input by that time <coughs> had already been compromised by obliterating that part of the city. The other, <coughs> the other more so positive experience uh, of a successful campaign to, to try to uh, safeguard the interests of <coughs> a wider so group of citizens um, is the case of Portland Works. And for uh, the Portland Works campaign, uh, a diverse community, for me, uh, uh, an actual diverse community coalesced together around the immediate threat of losing such an important heritage complex. <coughs> and we worked with anyone who had an interest and we, crea and we created the conditions for many to engage with different levels of intensity according to their capacity. We also worked really hard to allow multiple views to be expressed. And that was um, maybe a sort of an under, um, under discussed aspect of the whole project, but um, a lot of effort and care really went into creating processes that would allow multitude of, uh, of opinion that, and, and avoiding consensus at every stage and accepting that different views on issues were fine. Um, so now <coughs> there are around 600 shareholders that collectively own and manage the building. 
And I, once, I wouldn't say that this group is necessarily always harmonious. I would argue that the, the, the diversity, the representativity, representativity of this group, as well as the fact that they interact through coalescing spatially around the world, but also through digital platforms, I think it makes it an actual community. Um, <clears throat> so I would like to conclude by saying that from a practice and pedagogical perspective, uh, we need to understand and embrace the importance of telling stories. Uh, in our work, we need to be mindful uh, of, an, of allowing for a multiplicity of voices without claiming that our story is the story. For many years, I've been running a PGT module that, um, in which we look at decision making in the city um, and, how, and how they're made, but also um, students have to confront themselves with telling the story of those decisions. And by doing that, they very much curate the story and um, they, they find their own voice in that. All our urban design students uh, have been learning about storytelling as a tool, both for, uh, for understanding and for proposing interventions. In any process that we design, facilitate and support, we need to ask ourselves about the ethics of what we do. Who are we supporting? Who will gain and who will lose out? Whose voice we are not being able to hear? Here. And crucially, where does the money come from and where does it come from? Thank you. Thank you very, very much. And now we have four to five minutes for questions and comments. So if I can ask Indy and uh, Tatiana to join Christina in the table.